Yikes, our walls are under attack. It's time for book two of Virgil's Aeneid. So we pick up with book two immediately uh, at the end of book one where Dido had said, tell me about the stories, Aeneas. Tell me of your own perspective. And this is interesting, right? Because Dido knows these stories. We just saw the ephesus of the freeze. And now um, she's saying, tell it to me in your own words. So we're kind of getting rid of a middle person in terms of the narration here, a really exciting way, getting closer, we might say, to the source. So today at the beginning of this, I wanna focus on two particular aspects, which are going to be the Trojan horse and Laocoon. And then in the second half, I'm going to talk about Pietas and the idea of pastiche. So let's get started. The most fundamental thing to know is there is no Trojan horse in the Iliad. The Iliad does not end with the fall of Troy. It in fact ends with the funeral of Hector Hippodamoios, Hector the tamer of horses. So get any of that out of your brain. But there is some sweet Trojan horse action in the Odyssey, which is the other great Homeric epic. And here, it appears twice. It's never called the Trojan horse. It's called the wooden horse at that point. So we see in Odyssey 4, and this is the translation by Emily Wilson. I never saw a man so resolute as that Odysseus, how tough he was and what impressive fortitude he showed inside the wooden horse. We fighters lurked inside to bring destruction to the Trojans. And so Menelaus brings it up there. Um, later on, we have this moment where Demodocus is um, playing a song among the Phaeacians and Odysseus asks for a story. You tell so accurately, so we had wooden horse over there. Oh, that's okay, green. Just so we're, just so we're marking these things here. Right? So we have wooden horse. You tell so accurately what the Greeks achieved and what they suffered there at Troy as if you had been there or heard about it from somebody who was. So sing the story about the wooden horse, which Epheus built with Athena's help. Odysseus dragged it inside the citadel, filled up with men to sack the town. If you can tell that as it happened, I will say that you are truly blessed with inspiration. So again, we're thinking about the Trojan horse as this story that people are telling and retelling. And now Aeneas is giving his version. It also exists from material culture. Here, for instance, is the famed uh, Mykonos vase. And you can tell that this is the Trojan horse because uh, you see our little fellas hidden inside of there. And so um, then we get a little bit from Aeneas talking to Dido. So we're returning here now to the Aeneid. But if you have such desire to learn of our misfortunes and briefly hear of Troy's last agonies, though my mind shudders at the memory and recoils in sorrow, I'll begin. After many years have slipped by, the leaders of the Greeks, opposed by the fates and damaged by the war, built a horse of mountainous size through palaces divine art and weave planks of fur over its ribs. Fur is a type of wooden um, of tree and palace, as we know, is um, Minerva, Athena in the Greek. They secretly hide a picked body of men chosen by Lot there in the dark body, filling the belly and the huge cavernous insides with armed warriors. Tenedos is within sight, an island known to fame, rich in wealth, which Priam's kingdom remained, now just a bay and an unsafe anchorage for boats. They sail there and hide themselves on the lonely shore. So this is going to be important. Um, so what this is describing is there's kind of the shoreline where, um, where Troy is, and then there's an island out to the distance. And so what the uh, Greeks have done is they've left the boat, or sorry, they left the Trojan horse on the shore, and then they've taken their boat and sailed it to the other side of the island so they can't be seen. So it looks like they've sailed away and left this thing there. So folks come rushing out to look at this, and there's a big debate. What should we do with it? Should we accept it or shall we destroy it? So some on this side were amazed at Virgin Minerva's fatal gift and marvel at the horse's size. 
And at the first, the Moitiers, um, whether through treachery or because Troy's fate was certain, urged that it be dragged inside the walls and placed on the citadel. A citadel is a massive structure at the center of a, a town, often with uh, religious and political import. But then also people want to destroy it. So, but Capus and those of wiser judgment commanded us to either hurl this deceit of the Greeks, this suspect gift into the sea, or to set fire to it from beneath, or pierce its hollow belly and probe for hiding places. The crowd, uncertain, was split by opposing opinions. Then Laocoon rushes down eagerly from the heights of the citadel to confront them all, a large crowd with him, and shouts from far off, oh, unhappy citizens, what madness. Do you think the enemy sailed away, or do you think any Greeks gift free of treachery? Is that Ulysses's reputation either? There are Greeks in hiding concealed by the wood, or it's been built as a machine to use against our walls, or spy on our homes, or fall on the city from above, or it hides some other trick. Trojans, don't trust this horse, whatever it is. I'm afraid of Greeks, even those bearing gifts. Timeo Danaos et Dona Parentes. I fear the gift, I'm afraid of Greeks, even those bearing gifts gifts. And so we come back to him because this uh, book two is structured in a really exciting interlocked way, A-B-A-B. So we introduce the, the conflict with accepting the horse with Laocoon, and uh, then we go to Sinon, which is where we're going next, and then we go back to Laocoon, and then the fall. And so we kind of interweave these narratives. So we jump now, or we will, after we talk about this, um, coming directly from Odyssey 8, this idea of what to do with it. So back in Odyssey 8, right, Demodocus is talking, a god inspired the bard to sing. He started with how the Greeks set fire to their camp and then embarked and sailed away. Okay, so we have that same element going to behind Tenedos, and here we have the Greeks sailing away. Meanwhile, Odysseus brought in a gang inside the heart of Troy, inside the horse. The Trojans pulled the thing up to the summit, recall that idea of the citadel, and sat around discussing what to do. Some said, we ought to strike the wood with swords. Others said, drag it higher up and hurl down from the rocks. But some said they should leave it to pacify the gods. So it would be. The town was doomed to ruin when it took that horse, chock full of fighters, bringing death to the Trojans. And he sang, Demodocus, how the Achaeans poured from the horse and ambushed from the hollow and sacked the city. And that's where we will be getting to. So let's get back here to um, Sinon's plot. This is really important to understand. Sinon is a Greek. And he's been left behind in order to ensure that the Trojan horse gets brought inside. So the first thing that Sinon needs to do is appeal to the Trojan sense of mercy and honor. And so he's wandering around. He's, got, he's, he's bound up, kind of limping. He looks all beaten up. And he's like, help, help, help. And the Trojans are like, hey, look what we found. And he says, oh, man, Odysseus had this plan. And they wanted to do some human sacrifice with me. But I ran away. Yikes, very sad, very sad. And then the Trojans are like, oh, this person seems like he's probably okay. And so Sinon thinks to himself, nailed it. So now he's going to be believed. And now that he's been believed, his next step is to get that horse inside. Warned by him, they set up this horse, of a, the statue of a horse for the wounded goddess instead of the Palladium to atone severely, severally for their sin. And Calchas ordered them to raise the huge mass of woven timbers raised to the sky. Excuse me, so this is Sinon talking, right? He's saying, hey, our prophet said that we had to build this thing. And we had to build it because Athena is mad. Um, raised to the sky. And they needed to build it such that, and this is what's gonna be really important, so the gates would not take it, nor could it be dragged inside the walls or watch over the people in their ancient rites. So what he's saying here is it needs to be wider than your gates and it needs to be um, higher than your walls. All right, so wider than your gates, higher than your walls. Now Sinon makes his move since if your hands violated Minerva's gift, then utter ruin would come to Priam and the Trojans. 
So now, right, the idea is, hey, we can get this horse in if we like break it up. But then he says, no, you can't break it. You can't violate it because then ruin will come to you. Yet, if it ascends into your citadel, dragged by your hands, Asia would come down to the very walls of Pelops and Mighty War and a like fate would await our children, our being Greek. So the idea is, hey, if you destroy this thing, then you're gonna be ruined. But if you bring it in, then you'll be saved. And in fact, you will get revenge. Of course, they're gonna have a massive hole in their wall. And there's all these warriors hidden away. So this is the way this treachery works. It's marvelously deceptive. So let's talk a little bit now about the return of Laocoon, because he has come rushing. Then something greater and more terrible befalls us wretches. This is Aeneas speaking and stirs our unsuspecting souls. Laocoon, chosen by lot as a priest of Neptune, was sacrificing a huge bull at the customary altar. See, a pair of serpents with huge coils snaking over the sea from Tenedos through the tranquil deep. I shudder to tell it. And heading for the shore side by side, their fronts lift high over the tide and their blood red crests top the waves. The rest of their body slides through the ocean behind and their huge backs arch in voluminous folds. There's a roar from the foaming sea. Now they reach the shore and with burning eyes suffused with blood and fire, lick at their hissing jaws with flickering tongues. Blanching at the sight, we scatter. They move on a set course towards Laocoon and the first of each serpent entwines the slender bodies of his two sons and biting at them, devours their wretched limbs. Then, as he comes to their aid, weapon in hand, they seize him too and wreathe him in massive coils, now encircling his waist twice, twice winding their scaly folds around his throat, their high necks and heads tower above him. He strains to burst the knots with his hands, his sacred headband drenched in blood and dark venom, while he sends terrible shouts up to the heavens. Like the bellowing of a bull that has fled wounded from the altar, shaking the useless ax from its neck. But the serpentine pair escape, slithering away to the high temple and seek the stronghold of the fierce palace to hide there under the goddess's feet and the circle of her shield. So this omen is what ultimately will convince the Trojans to bring in the horse. This is a hugely famous moment though. This image that uh, Virgil describes of Laocoon being bitten, it finds resonance and the story is known. There's a parallel here with this statue, um, Laocoon and his sons. So there's some debate about if this predates the Aeneid and, Aeneid and Virgil is responding to this or if it comes after. So you can't date scum statuary as easily as you can other elements. And so what do you notice here that's the same? Well, clearly we have the two uh, boys that are mentioned, right? Clearly we have this one here, we have this one here. We have Laoko in the middle, is he having a good time? No, <laughs> absolutely not. And we get the biting of the hip here with the serpent. And so we have this moment of sculpture and stat uh, the poetry kind of interacting. And just what that interaction is, is kind of up for you to decide and think about. But it shows the impact of the scene, how Virgil in his poetry is creating a visual sculpture almost. Um, at the end of the 19th century, uh, Josef Hertel made Leoko and his sons here out of the uh, actual skeletons of um, snake and humans. It was destroyed in bombings in 1940. But it's kind of good to know it exists. Um, and then of course, you can also pastiche things. And so here we have this comic from Far Side where we get our butcher entwined with the sausages and then the two fellows there. So this shows kind of the, the impact of poetry and visual culture on modern contemporary society in the world. Of course, this person is perhaps like um, some modern viewers that are like, is that a reference to something? What's going on? 
So a couple more things here. The Trojan horse <coughs> manifests in a Trojan horse meme that's happening. Um, you can make one of these on Imgur yourself. So basically, um, you have the blank template, and then here's a popular one. Like, you're so excited. That's me. I'm going to turn on my computer with Windows. Yay. And then it says, like, you got to update. So a lot of these are innocent. Um, you can make them. Uh, if you have a meme brain, you can make 50 of them an hour. However, they're not always funny and innocent and like sardonic. Memes can also be hugely dangerous, as in this following case. So here uh, we're going to look at two moments where memes, uh, the Trojan horse meme is used for racist purposes. So here in this first one, um, we see that Europe here is behind the Trojan walls and the horse is saying, let me in. We're only for Syrian refugees and stuff. And then we have the racist comment that refugees are actually going to be terrorists. This of course creates a fear in the eye of, of the beholder, right? The betrayal. And so it's drawing on that classical material to encourage racist international policy. Similarly, in response to the coronavirus, this was a meme that was going around in which you have the coronavirus set up as a plot. Um, you'll see down here that this person is wearing a mask to kind of bring it in. And then inside we have racial stereotypes, anti-Semitic stereotypes of Jewish people. And this is a version of the Trojan horse meme that is um, purporting QAnon, which is a hyper hoax conspiracy theorist uh, fringe group saying that the coronavirus is not real and is in fact a way for um, Jewish people to gain more power. This again is deeply, deeply anti-Semitic. I want you to be aware that these kind of things exist and to be able to parse it. One of the things that you do in a literature class, especially one like this, is you learn how this kind of material can be appropriated and you can learn um, how maybe to combat it. Uh, so let's keep going. At this point, the horse enters Troy. We're going to see a couple of these elements that we've been looking at. We breached the wall and opened up the defenses of the city. So there it is. By breaching the wall, we tore down the wall, got rid of the gate. We made the mistake. All prepared themselves for the work, and they set up wheels allowing movement under its feet and stretch hemp ropes round the neck. The engine of fate mounts our walls, pregnant with armed men. Around it, boys and virgin girls, a reminder of who's about to die, sing sacred songs and delight in touching their hands to the ropes. Up it glides and rolls threateningly into the midst of the city. Oh, my country. Oh, Ilium, house of the gods, and you, Trojan walls, famous in war. Four times it sticks at the threshold of the gates, and four times the weapons clash in the bellies. Notice here at the threshold, we're at the liminal stage, right? We're literally passing over a threshold from one state to the next, from safety to danger. Yet we press on regardless, blind with frenzy, and sight the accursed creature on top of our sacred citadel. Even then Cassandra, who by the God's decree is never to be believed by Trojans, reveals our future fate with her lips. I want to talk about Cassandra for a brief moment. Um, in the mythological narrative, right, she's really, really um, common because she's this voice of the unheeded. So basically, uh, she's a beautiful Trojan princess, and she gains prophecy from Apollo. There's a couple different ways that the narrative says this. So in some, um, Apollo clearly wants to have sex with her. Unlike a lot of narratives, Apollo does not rape Cassandra. But instead, he offers her gifts as she manipulates him, right? When she kind of finally says, okay, well, the last thing I want is prophecy, he gives it to her, and then she still refuses to have sex with him, at which point he says, well, then you're going to be cursed. And so you'll have this prophecy, but nobody will ever believe you. And here in this 1898 depiction by Evelyn de Morgan, we see Cassandra with the burning walls of Troy behind her. One of the things to emphasize about Cassandra is like the Laocoon image, we live in a world where Cassandra is part of our vocabulary. And so you get this idea of the Cassandra syndrome or the Cassandra's complex. And so here, what I've done quickly is I just looked, uh, I did a quick Google search of Cassandra next to climate change, right? To show how uh, scientists and leaders have been ignored 
by climate change denialists. And that leads to the fact that we live in a world that's increasingly um, apt to destroy itself at any moment. And so this use of the word Cassandra as a mythological illusion to refer to somebody that's being ignored, even though they are the people that have the knowledge, is part of our everyday vocabulary. So Aeneas is running around, running around, and then um, having fights. Hector comes along, though, and appears to him in a dream. Hector, of course, we will remember um, from the end of the Aeneid, of the Iliad. See in dreams before my eyes, Hector seemed to stand there, saddest of all, and pouring out great tears, torn by the chariot, as once he was, black with bloody dust. So here, a slight allusion, right, to Achilles dragging his body around the walls of Troy. Ah. Uh, Son of the goddess, fly. Tear yourself from the flames. The enemy has taken the walls. Troy falls from her high place. Enough has been given to Priam and your country. If Pergamon could be saved by any hand, it would have been saved by this. Troy entrusts her sacred relics and household gods to you. Take them as friends of your faith. Seek mighty walls for them. Those you will found at last when you have wandered the sea. So here's the mission. Aeneas has to take these gods and bring them um, to a new land, right? This is where we started with the proem of the Aeneid. We had the bastard bound on sea, fated to be in exile. And so here he comes. Aeneas then uh, is about to go find his family, but first he looks at the city and sees then in truth, all Ilium seemed to me to sink in flames, and Neptune's Troy was toppled from her base, just as when foresters on the mountain heights compete to uproot an ancient ash tree, struck time and again by axe and blade, it threatens continually to fall with trembling foliage and shivering crown, till gradually, vanquished by the blows, it groans at last, and torn from the ridge, crashes down in ruin. And so as in any time we have an epic simile, we need to break it down into what's going on here. Well, we have our right. So is this a good thing? No, it's deeply, deeply sorrowful. Notice it's an ancient tree. Um, it's threatening to fall. It's trembling. It's shivering. It's vanquished. It groans. It's torn. And it crashes. <coughs> All of these words building up a pathos for the fall of Troy. Using an epic simile metaphor of deforestation which is very, very interesting, obviously, right? Humans interacting with the natural world, it implies there's something unnatural about the fall of Troy. All right, so they get, Aeneas gets back home and he tries to get his dad to come along, um, but his dad's like, I'm old, I'm gonna stay here and die. So we on our side, Creusa, my wife and Ascanius, that's his son, all our household weeping bitterly, determined that he should not destroy everything along with himself and crush us by urging our doom. He refused and clung to his place and his purpose. I hurried to my weapons again and miserably longed for death, since what tactic or opportunity was open to us now? Dad, no, oh, sorry, did you think I would leave you, father, and depart? Did such sinful words fall from your lips? Right, so now Aeneas is saying, well, I had this job I was supposed to go do, but now my dad's not leaving, so I'm not leaving either. Here we go, let's die in battle, hurrah, what a great thing it is. Well, and Kaisis has a little bit of a like brain recovery. He speaks, and now the fire is more audible through the city and the blaze rolls its tide nearer. This is Aeneas. Come then, dear father, clasp my neck. I will carry you on my shoulders. The task won't weigh on me. Whatever may happen, it will be for us both the same shared risk and the same salvation. Let little Eulis come with me and let my wife follow our footsteps at a distance. You, father, take the sacred objects and our country's gods in your hands. 
Until I've washed it in running water, it would be a sin for me coming from such fighting and recent slaughter to touch them. So saying, bowing my neck, I spread a cloak made of tawny lion's hide over my broad shoulders and bend to the task. Little Ulysses clasps his hand in mine. Ulysses again is Ascanius and follows his father's long strides. My wife walks behind. So this is a massively popular piece of iconography. And it's a piece of iconography that expresses a very specific Roman belief, a fundamental belief in Roman religious, civic, and filial society, familial society. And this idea is pietas. And pietas is a three-part articulation of loyalty to the gods, to the state and citizens, and to the family. So let's look at what it involves. And clearly it's not going to involve Creusa. This is also fundamentally rooted in the patriarchy. So come my dear father, clasp my neck, I will carry you on my shoulders. Do we see that? Yes, here's our dear father. There he is, he's on the shoulders. Let Ulysses come with me. <clears throat> yep, there he is, no problem. Sacred objects, we got him right there, holding them in his hands. So what do we see then visually? We have the older generation being supported by, held up by the middle generation and the middle generation, Aeneas, is guiding or leading the younger generation. Okay, so this is, the older generation is in charge of the gods. They know the proper um, ceremonies and respect. So they're gonna be in charge of that. Aeneas is kind of gonna be in charge of the state and the citizens, getting everybody to safety, finding this new area, this new um, territory for his people. And he's also gonna be connected to his family. His family though is defined by patrilineal connections, father, son, son. The wife is left behind. The wife is just a carrier of blood of um, the baby. So I wanna show you part of the popularity of this image, right? So here we have a coin that predates the Aeneid, um, a denarius of Julius Caesar. Um, and it's a little bit different, right? Than the one we were just looking at, but here you can see Aeneas there. He's carrying what's called a palladium. Um, our buddy uh, Anchises is holding the box religious objects, and then that, of course, is Anchises. Compare this to a very vivid, cheap uh, reproduction, I made it just made out of terracotta, right? Ascanius or Ulysses, right there, we've got our hands being held, we've got um, Aeneas, we got uh, the father, and we have the sacred objects. Um, just briefly, it's so this is from the, the one here on the right is from the first century. Bernini, 1700 years later, uh, is continuing to work on this. And so here you see Ascanius or Ulysses um, and Chises, who's finally kind of shaped like a, a man would be. And we got some sacred objects up on it. So now we're gonna look at, kind of change directions a bit with this idea. Because we're gonna look here at this object on the right. As you can see, they're structured in the same way. We have three figures, right? We got three heads though. And what's interesting about those heads? Well, they are dogs. We have walking dogs. These dogs are walking. The iconography though is so clear. So we have the hand holding that we're used to and we have the sacred objects. So in addition to them being dogs, um, they obviously also have these erect, semi-erect penises. So what's going on here? We have over on the left, a version of a very, very sacred image, super commonplace. And then on the right, we have this highly referential, maybe irreverent, irreverent, sorry, irreverent depiction of the same scene. So a couple of things to know. Uh, the one on the right has no power without the one on the left. It would be um, simply three 
animal figures with uh, their penises out walking along. It gains power through its reference. So then you can think about what it's doing. Is it trying to undermine or is it simply just being playful as a reference? Um, and that's a place for you to enter into interpretation as to what you think is appropriate for playing with well-known images. So let's look at uh, some non-religious context for this. As you might know, very recently uh, in France, uh, there was a, a satirical magazine made called Charlie Hebdo, and I'm not gonna show these images, um, and uh, a great amount of violence was perpetuated against them because of images that they portrayed that had religious significance. So this is really um, controversial stuff, it can be. So I'm gonna show a couple images that are not so controversial. Here, for instance, is Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper on the left being parodied by a modern example of Disney princesses taking the place. And yet it's still capable of great challenge and interpretation. For instance, choosing a woman of color to be in the middle here, Jasmine from the Middle East responds provocatively to the way in which Jesus has been westernized in um, Christianity, right? They've gotten rid of the fact that he's like, <laughs> a Palestinian, you would be brown and have like black hair. So challenging some of those notions. We're adding an element of all of these women teaming up together to um, make plans. We're throwing the obnoxious um, man, uh, snowman out in the sunny area where he's sure to melt. So a lot of good stuff happening here. Or take this example, Edward Hopper's Nighthawks on the left, depicting um, three customers and a worker uh, late at night, in kind of an abandoned area of town, perhaps. We don't know their story. We're left curious about it. On the right, we're pastiching that with um, combining Moss Eisley Cantina, or in this case, I think it's um, Dex's from hey, the prequel trilogy, and uh, uh, we had a great visual joke with R2-D2 and C-3PO being outside because in Star Wars A New Hope, uh, we were told uh, from Moss Eisley, hey, we don't allow their kind in here, uh, and a reference um, maybe to that moment. Inside, we have a very odd thing with like Yoda and Darth Maul hanging out together. Um, and it's open to interpretation, like what, what you think this means, what's going on here. And that's the great joy of engaging with this kind of material is thinking through what it means to respond to these earlier texts. Um, and so the last thing before we leave is the last moment of book two, the loss of Creusa. Aeneas was escaping, right? Holding his son's hand, got his dad on his shoulder. The people of Troy are all around him. He's running the boat. Some hostile power at this scattered my muddled wits. For while I was following alleyways and straying from the region of streets, we knew. Did my wife, Creusa, halt, snatched away from me by a wretched fate? Or did she wander from the path or collapse with weariness? Who knows? She was never restored to our sight. My sweet husband. Oh, and then she shows up, but she's a ghost. Oh, sweet husband. What use is it to indulge in such mad grief? This has not happened without the divine will, neither its laws nor the ruler of great Olympus let you take Creusa with you away from here. Yours is a long exile. You must plow a vast reach of sea and you will come to Asperia's land where Lydian Tiber flows in gentle course among the farmer's rich fields. There, happiness, kingship, and a royal wife will be yours. Banish these tears for your beloved Creusa. All right, so this is one of the worst parts of this kind of like, patriarchal misogyny that underlies this poem where the woman, the first wife who um, is just kind of getting erased and worse than that, she says, hey, go with my sanction. Like, I, I approve of this, it, it fits with the plan. Um, and that takes us through the second book of Virgil's Aeneid. And it sets us up really nicely for where we're going, which will be the return to talking about Dido and what's happening in Carthage with a needed